New Newcastle, Nathan Brown gets the nod and starts the next phase of a Knights football rebuild. It's now official, official. Nathan Brown has been appointed as the new head coach of the Newcastle Knights. Brown spoke about the latest chapter in his career at the announcement ceremony earlier today. The big key is, you know, is to build from the bottom up and you know, introduce some good young players that have been introduced and try and find some more good young players and uh, obviously uh, win, that, win the, the surrounding areas back, I suppose. I believe that Newcastle have lost some air, lost some ground to other teams. If we can get that part off the field right and introduce some good young kids and then and then look to build the team from the bottom up over a period of time. Brian wants it in a couple of years. Is that doable, Nathan? He's very passionate, the chairman. He's a good man. He's very successful, obviously, and hopefully his passion will rub off onto, onto plenty of the players as well. But, look, there's, there's no predictions about what you can and can't do in, in two or three years. The, the thing is, is the club is where it is. It's had a pretty bad 10 or 12 years, and so there's obviously things that, that need fixing. And... And over a period of time, we'll, I'm sure we'll learn some stuff in the next three or four weeks. I don't think Nathan Brown could have answered that question about the chairman wanting a premiership inside three years any better. He's yeah. very passionate, and I can only hope that his passion rubs off yeah. on the players. Yeah, but he also put a but in there, which was the little part of him just letting out a little bit more than probably intended. Yeah. Which, in other words, no, there's no way the Knights but can win a premiership not, in two years. But we but... might not win one for another ten years, maybe. Well, I don't know about 10 years. Oh, Look, I'm just saying. 10 so. years is going to be a complete new roster to what they've got now, but certainly there's not the roster there now to win it in two years. Yeah. It, it, it just won't happen. But, but what you want to see in the next two years is improvement. Nathan Brown's yes. more than capable of doing that. Yep. And you want to see uh, just div this back to what the club used to be as far as development and as far as... Yeah. Yeah, they've got to build from the ground up Newcastle. Look, they can't go for a quick they just fix. They just need a good roster. You know, I mean, you, you, you yeah. want to be in the business of winning seasons when you're an NRL club and an NRL coach. That mm. means winning more games than you lose. And you want to inch your way closer to a premiership every year. And to do that, you need a strong roster. Yeah. So, with respect to that, who does he go and get in the short term? He's got to go and buy some size. You think it's in the front row? Yeah, well, and he's lost a little bit of edge there. He's lost likes of both Scott. Yeah. So I, I think he's got to look at big props. He's got to look at uh, some just strong edge runners too. He just needs a bit of size and aggro. Like, you've got the, the Sims boys there. They need a little bit of help, yeah, and because in the rotation, they just need somebody that when they're off the field can bring stuff with them. What about Robbie Farrar? He's on the market. You probably get him for a good price. You think he can come to that club? Adam Clydesdale well, look, the, and the, Tyler Randall? The word, the, is, the word is Nathan Brown's very keen to get Robbie Farrar there. Having said that, that, that is one area. They've got a couple of good young kids coming through. And, and they've got a, 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 two young boys who are two or three years away from being really good quality. Very handy. First because, graders. But could Robbie Farrar help that development? Yeah, he could, but you've got to be careful that the kids don't see it as a blockage and it's, yep. a, it's something that they can't get past and that he's going to hold back their involvement as, a, as players so they then begin to look elsewhere. And that, that's, a, that's the problem. That's what's got to be now managed by the new coach. He's got to figure out a way. But he is keen on, on Robbie Farrer. And he knows Robbie Farrer. He worked with Robbie in the New South Wales side this yeah, year. Yeah, and he's already got the State of Origin halfback next year coming. Yes. So if you suddenly pour, put out next year the Knights of the New South Wales six, uh, 7 and 9, you're starting to look It's a good right. start. And then you've got the base like um, you know, the, the fullback. Sione Mataudia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and you got you got young Jake good, Mamo. J Jake Mamo. Yeah. You got good young kids there coming through as well. So. Yeah, you have Dane Gagai's playing great. He just re-signed this year. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. The, there's there's a core there to build on. But I just think in the short term, if he wants success as quick as the chairman wants it, he's going to have to go to market. It's not going to come from the, the Hunter region. He's definitely got to do that. But it, but it's the positions you go after. Yes. It's not necessarily the hooker when you've got hookers there. It's it's. Agreed. Elsewhere. Just quickly, Nathan Brown, given the job up in Newcastle, uh, three years, uh, tough gig for him. You know the, the landscape up there. Is he a good fit for it? I think he would be. You know, they've got a real young team coming through, obviously, with uh, Kurt Gidley, you know, gone this year and, you know, a few other senior players. But, you know, they've got guys like, you know, Jeremy Smith in the forwards and the, both Sims brothers that are, you know, playing out of their skin this year, I thought. Um, you know, the halves combination, I think Jared Mullen will be under a lot of pressure, but I think, you know, the Mattel team brothers can all come through. Dan Gagai, Jake you know Mamo. what I mean? Jake Mamo. So he's got a really good crop of young kids there, you know, and I think uh, Brownie can, you know, put out a game plan where, where they can, um, you know, really give it a shake. I think they'll be a totally different team next Yeah, I think year. you're right. Yeah, he's become a good friend of the show and we wish him all the best up there and good to see him back coaching in the NRL. Later on the show, we're going to catch up with Johnny Sutton, find out what is happening 
happening at South Sydney. And my one-on-one's a very different one tonight. It, it, he's come, something of a mystery man. His name's Greg Smith. He played one game for the Newcastle right. Knights uh, just before the turn of the century. Uh, somewhat controversial figure, but um, I think you'll enjoy the chat that we're about to have. I'm going to take a break now. I'm going to come back and chat with a guy who tried to do it differently to Jarrett Hayne. He tried to join the American game to come to ours with some mixed success. You'll find out. Tonight, a Jared Haynesque story in reverse. The American high school athlete and contracted Philadelphia Eagles player who in 1999 chased an NRL dream at the Newcastle Knights. Here to recount his story, Greg Smith joins me one on one. Greg, good to meet you. And let me say that of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of players who played one first grade game of rugby league, your story might just be the most unusual. But can I start by asking you, have you followed the Jared Hayne progress with the 49ers? Oh, yes, I have. Uh, pretty much from the time he announced that he was going to the 49ers up until uh, making the 53-man roster. So it's been, uh, I've been following him online quite a bit. Did it cause you to pause and, and reflect on your own journey? Uh, yes, it did, most definitely. Um, I remember making that decision uh, to, you know, a tri rugby league at the time and uh, uh, all, the, you know, the anticipation of what to, you know, expect and, uh, and, and what, you know, move into a, a foreign country where most, well, ma mainly none of your family is there. So I can understand what he was going through. All right, let's go right back to the beginning. Where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in a small town in uh, Louisiana called Derrida. And um, I was the uh, second oldest of uh, six kids. Um, my, the oldest one was uh, a stepsister of mine, uh, so she mainly wasn't in the house most of the time. Uh, she just come around, uh, you know, sometimes very, uh, sometimes sometimes during the se during the seasons. Um, and um, my father was uh, military background, and uh, from uh, I say seven eight years old, I was actually a baseball player that started out. Yeah. So how big was sport in your upbringing? Oh, uh, very big, very big. Um, pretty much uh, all your friends in the neighborhood was playing some sort of sport. Uh, in the state of Louisiana, uh, I, I think parents uh, they said you either play baseball or you play uh, basketball or football, or you don't you don't you know you don't have any <laughs> basically any outside life other than playing you know playing some sports. So. All right, well, you went to university, Fort Hayes and Western State, and then you found your way to the Philadelphia Eagles. Can yes. you tell us how that came about? Well, um, it, uh, the process started my third year uh, of uni, so uh, I was at Western State at the time. Um, the head coach uh, of the football, uh, football team said, hey, there's uh, scouts coming around, and uh, they're, they're uh, normally in your third year, they look at players who... Uh, have potential to uh, make an NFL team. Uh, at the time, they uh, they go out, they do agility test on you, and then the main key is the 40-yard dash. And at the time, I ran a, a 4-3-3, and that sort of sparked the interest of, of uh, other NFL teams. And that's basically where the process started. Uh, and then from there, uh, at uh, my final year of uh, of uh, eligibility in, in, in uh, university. Uh, I got a, a free agent contract to the Philadelphia Eagles. All right, so tell us about your experience with the Eagles. I, um, sum it up, um, um, you, you, you get out there, 100 plus uh, athletes on the field, all vying for a 53 man roster. And uh, at the time, um, I remember looking at the depth chart because they, they, they don't hide anything from you. You look and they show you position to position. And uh, I was listed on the wide receiver because that was, you know, my, my position. Uh, and I was out of the 12 they had in camp, I was 12. And then I also remember seeing some sort of sn snippet in the newspaper saying, this guy won't make it through the first you know, week of a uh, training camp. So I, instead of, you know, looking at that and thinking, oh, I'm done, I, I used it as motivation. Uh, back then in 96, they had um, uh, between the first and second game, uh, there was the first cuts and I made it through that. Then um, uh, after the third game, uh, that was the second cut. So basically they would do the 
or they would sort of shape the team into a 53-man roster before the uh, fourth game of uh, preseason. And um, the way they let you know if you're cut uh, at the time is uh, you're normally in a room, in a hotel room with your roommate. Uh, I remember it was Sunday evening, and they said, uh, if you get a letter under your door and have your name on it, that means uh, you're cut. So, and I remember that night pacing the room, and then at the time I said, uh, I think it was about 10 o'clock, and I said, uh, I'll, I'll uh, go get something to eat. So I went to get something to eat, come back, open up the door, and I see a letter. Uh, and it's turned over on its, on, on its opposite side, and I'm thinking, please don't be me, please don't be me, and uh, picked it up, and it was actually my roommate. And uh, so they cut him, um, and then uh, pretty much the next day, they said, uh, uh, if you're still here, you're on a 53-man roster. So I thought, oh, you know, good. And then we had a little uh, uh, presentation, and they announced me. I said, okay, good, I'm on the roster. But then 48 hours later, uh, when they made adjustments, here comes well. the cut. I'm cut before, uh, well, while we were preparing for our last preseason game, boom, I'm cut. That's and that's, that's the nature of the business. Yeah. All right, you tried your luck then at Saskatchewan. Yes. And same kind of, of situation. How the heck then did you finish up as a Newcastle Knight? Well, um, it started out um, with the World Sevens, uh, early 1998. 90, I had got an, um, an invitation from a, a local manager in uh, the U.S. who also was working in relationship with a manager here in Australia. And uh, they were doing uh, the U.S. Uh, US team, uh, World Sevens, yep. uh, at the Sydney Football Stadium. And uh, played in uh, three games uh, in the World Sevens, uh, sparked some, some interest. And um, then from there, went on to uh, West, uh, Western uh, Suburbs Metro Cup uh, to play for that squad and uh, sparked some interest from there. Um, and then at the time, Warren Ryan got the job at Newcastle. And uh, from there, he was uh, interested in me coming up there and trialing with the Newcastle Knights. What did you make of Warren Ryan? He didn't hold back. I mean, I remember um, at training, you know, if you, you were bad, he, he was straight shooting. He'd tell you, you you're bad. Uh, or, you know, he, he, he always had these different, di different uh, slogans or messages for people. But I, if you worked hard, uh, he, he worked hard, he, and he saw the potential, and he, he would find any way possible to, to use you. All right, so. you played some Metro Cup, and you, you went to Newcastle, but how much did you really know about rugby league? Mm, um, n well, not, not much at first, um, um, uh, you know, but um, pretty much uh, from day one I was at Newcastle, um, I had what I did because I said, hey, if I'm going to be here and I'm going to really try for this team, I need to, you know, find every aspect of time to learn the game. And so uh, pretty much every day I was watching, you know, two or three videotapes, sort of watching what wingers do, you know, on offense, what they do on def defense. And uh, my, my, pretty much my life during that period, uh, there was no social life. Uh, you know, when players were going, you know, going out to the pub, I was at home read I was at home watching videos. And so that from there is where I started to, you know, start to understand a little bit about the game. Did you sign a contract at the Knights? Oh, uh, yes, I did. At the time, I signed uh, right after, uh, I think it was the last trial, they, I signed on to stay, you know, with the, uh, with the club uh, and uh, pretty much started out in the reserve grades. I was speaking to Andrew Johns yesterday and he said that you were an extremely popular member of the playing group up there. So you obviously settled in quite well. Well, quite, yes. Um, and and the, the thing at the time, um, uh, they were also uh, quite intrigued about, you know, the NFL. And, uh, and uh, the other thing, too, um, Andrew uh, and his brother at the time, I think, they saw in me was uh, my pace, my speed. And, uh, and then I, you know, had, you know, great hands for, you know, the, uh, for, for kicks, you know, bombs and stuff like that. Great hands, uh, great um, explosiveness, uh, you know, very high vertical, stuff like that. And so they saw that there was opportunities to... Uh, to help, you know, with the club. You did impress in reserve grade and you scored tries down there. And when you were chosen in first grade, I would imagine there would have been a bit of talk about a guy called Manfred Moore, who yeah. in 1977 played at Newtown. He came across from I think, Oakland Raiders, yes. uh, played the Super Bowl and that over there. Did you know of him at all? At the time, I, I didn't uh, until, you know, I was, it was announced I was going to be in the first grade. Um, and uh, after that, I started seeing uh, information about him. Um, and Warren Ryan uh, pulled me aside, told me a little bit about him as well. And um, so I thought, you know, it was, um, at the time I thought, well, you know, he gave it a shot. He, he did, you know, did well. Uh, why not me? Why, why can't I, you know, fall in his footsteps and do the same thing? 
All right, well, you were chosen to make your first grade debut round three, 1999, mm -hmm. against the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs. Mm -hmm. What do you recall <sighs> of that game? Oh, um, well, I'm not going to sugar sugarcoat it. Uh, I, 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 um, I re recall, you know, me, you know, unfortunately dropping dropping balls, missing tackles. Um, but, you know, I remember I was out there. I was, you know, tr trying my best, working hard. But unfortunately, uh, it w wasn't my day, you know, for that. Yeah. After such a, a meagre apprenticeship, did, did you kind of feel like you had been thrown to the walls a little bit? Uh, not at all, because, I mean, I've, I've been, you know, uh, I guess from my background, um, professionally with, uh, you know, Philadelphia Eagles, um, everybody's thrown in as a you know, wolf. And, and when you're at that professional level, um, uh, you, uh, you know, you, your number can be called at any time. And I remember looking back at that time, we had a lot of injuries on the wing. And so um, I had a, had a couple of good reserve grade games and, and I knew there was a possibility that I could get called up. So, uh, you know, I make no excuses for, you know, poor performance. Uh, I just, you know, the next week I said, hey, just another week to get better. All right, critics in our game can be quite scathing. What was the reaction? What Did, did you cop it? Yes, I did. Um, and but that you know, if you get caught up into that stuff, uh, you, you're never gonna you know have an opportunity you know to, to improve. So uh, I I knew I deserved it in some aspects. Um, you know, I know some people probably thought you know it, it shouldn't have been up there, but uh, at the time uh, I I you know looking back I I had earned that opportunity to at least go up and help help with uh, the Newcastle Knights. Now you were accused of lying about your previous playing. Uh, career mm -hmm. over, overseas. Mm -hmm. Did you ever misrepresent yourself? Uh, not at all, not at all. And um, my thing is, um, I, at, at the time, um, I just looked at it as, you know, I looked at it as that's, that's not the, the thing to be worried about, you know. You know, people are gonna write what they wanna write, people are gonna talk what they wanna talk. Uh, I, I knew that, you know, I still needed to go out there and perform to the, you know, the best of my ability. You were released by the Knights mid-season, why yes. was that? Um, combination of things. I, I, I think um, I started to let, you know, um, I started to let some of that stuff that, you know, negative publicity get into my head. Um, I felt that it was uh, probably better for, for, for me and at the time my relationship also for the club. And, and I had no ill will with Newcastle um, because they, you know, then they always have a place in my heart because they gave me the opportunity and, you know, and they saw enough there to, to give me an opportunity. And then from there, you know, so I can't complain about, you know, what they did. So you went back and played some more Metro Cup. Mm -hmm. And what did you do then? Did you go back to the States or did you stay uh, here? Yeah, I played more Metro Cup. And then at the time, um, went back because um, I started to get in a serious relationship uh, with my wife. And so I went back, um, uh, made, you know, had to, you know, make some adjustments, uh, decide what I was going to do when I come back here. Because, I mean, I had a degree in business. I also had experience in IT. So I knew I can come back and work and also raise a family at the time. So. But today, sport still plays a major part in your life. Can you tell us? Oh, uh, yes. Um, now, um, I'm a, a master's athlete, so, you know, I uh, compete in athletics as well as I'm a, a, a full-time coach uh, for athletics. Uh, I have athletes uh, from age eight up to uh, Olympic level. Um, I had one successful uh, breakthrough in uh, the London 2012 Olympics. Uh, the first leg uh, at, uh, sprinter, Anthony Alosi, I was coaching him at the time. And uh, he uh, led the Australian uh, team in the finals, uh, first leg, and they wind up uh, um, equal in the uh, national record. OK, and you're also behind some other stars. I, I read somewhere that you were part of Angelina Jolie's Unbroken yes. movie. Well, the, the thing with that, um, uh, at the time, uh, as I, you know, the, the facility where I coach at, they had, um, it was booked out. And, uh, and at the time, we was in, you know, middle uh, part of our athletic season. And uh, so I had to make an adjustment uh, to a new training location. And, uh, at, and they, I found out later that it was booked out for this movie. And um, then from there, a couple of days later, I get a phone call uh, saying that uh, they need a running coach on the set. And would you be interested in ha having a chat with uh, Angelina and uh, the other directors? And so from there, uh, I think it was 48 hours later, I was on the set working with, uh, with her side by side. All right, we mentioned Jared earlier. You're probably in a, as good a position as anybody yeah. to know what 
He's going through what still faces him. Yeah. What do you make of what he's done thus well, far? Well, two things. When I, when I look at Jared, um, first thing is he's proved that he's got incredible athletic ability to, 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 trans, you know, to lead um, NRL at you know, one of the top, at, uh, at the time, the top uh, part of his, you know, his career. Yep. And, um, and then go over there, make this change, uh, prove to, uh, to the team in, in the preseason games that you know, he's, he's worth, worth the, the, the bet and, uh, and, you know, and then actually make the 53-man squad. The other thing I look at, too, is that the 49ers uh, saw enough there to, to, believe that they have, that, 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 to believe that they can invest more time in him over the next couple of years. So I think uh, this also opens up you know, opportunity for uh, other, other players, uh, both Gridiron as well as uh, NRL. Uh, uh, because I've always said, you know, over the last couple of years that I've been watching uh, the NRL, that the fullback position uh, translate quite well over to the uh, to the, the NFL because uh, they can work in space. Uh, kickoff return, punt return is the same type of player that has to work in space. So, all right. Do you ever regret your brief foray into rugby league? No, not at all. If I didn't do it, because at the time when I was given the offer, if I didn't do it, I would probably be sitting up here today uh, somewhere. You know, saying that, you know, I should have at least tried. And the other thing, too, is that from this, you know, I've, I've uh, got a you know, beautiful wife, three beautiful kids. Uh, I'm out in the uh, community helping, you know, young kids. Um, uh, this all started from the, the, the rugby league journey uh, over here to Australia. And you know what? There are thousands and thousands of young men out there who would love to do what you've done, and that's play a first grade rugby league game. You've done that. Thank you very much for your time. Nice, to, you. meet you. nice uh, to meet you. Good luck for future success. Thank and you. all the best. Thank you. Well, you can tell everybody. Yeah, you can tell everybody. Go ahead and tell everybody. Newcastle will have a new coach next year. Nathan yeah. Brown, what does he need to do to fix the, the Knights? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, Trent Hodkinson. I think he's a really, really good signing. Firstly, I'll tell you about Hodkinson. Mate, he's a consistent player, mate, and he likes responsibility. He's not a flashy player, but he's really, really consistent. Now, you pair him with Jared Mullen, a player who is flashy, who's brilliantly fast, great footwork, but doesn't like to be the be-all, end-all of the result. That's a really good combination, OK? Now, the next step is, who do they bring in to complement those two? Well, if you're talking about the all-important spine, then the bloke we're just talking about, Robbie Farrer. If Nathan Brown can land Robbie Farrer to the Newcastle Knights, you know, with Hodkinson, Mullen and Farrer, if they keep that spine intact, I think they make the finals. And for the Newcastle Knights, that's the start to turning the club around. Finally tonight, we finish with the game that is sweeping the nation. That's right, it's time for which coach is happy, which coach is upset. To start with, following the Knights' loss and the gaining of a new wooden utensil, it's a very sombre Danny Badiris. It's extremely disappointing to finish like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the same guy, because let's face it, nothing's going to stop old Danny boy from smiling. Um, yeah, a couple more wins and you're sort of sitting pretty and you can build on next year. But Everyone's a winner, and that's not the NRL news. Newcastle have a new coach, Nathan Brown, appointed officially this week. Uh, he, he looks like he's ready-made for the job, in my opinion, but he's got some tough decisions to make up there. He's got some good young talent coming through. Trent Hodkinson joins the club. That's a key signing. Uh, your old stomping ground, Joey. How do you see it? I think it's a great signing. Um, I think he's going to really concentrate on the junior structures coming through, on the players they need to retain in their juniors, and then the players where they're deficient in the first grade, he will go out and buy the best in that position. But... Uh, the, uh, the thing I like about Nathan Brown is he's got a close relationship with that north coast where he's from. Mm. So any, any really good kids from Newcastle up to the, the border, he'll know about. Hey, good evening. Welcome to the show. Nice to have your company. All the football now, sudden death. We love that. Makes it very exciting. Uh, I'm not going to be unoriginal, say, and then there were six, but realistically... Then there were six, and we'll get rid of two of those this weekend. <laughs> Good evening to you, Nathan Brown, the new Newcastle coach next year. Braitha Nasta and Stella. Corey Parker from the Brisbane Hi, Broncos with, with a week off. Welcome to you all, and I'll be sitting down with Alan Langer a little bit later in the show, a man who has achieved absolutely everything in the game. I'm sure that will be a fascinating chat. But first up, Brownie, uh, congratulations, mate. You were the last person in Australia to find out that, that you had the Newcastle job. You finally found that out, and uh, have you been able to hit the ground running at all? 
So I've been up a few times in a few days last week and heading up in the morning for a few days. So I do a few days a week at the latter part of the week and hopefully the storm keep going so I can keep doing a little bit there and then in October move up there early October. Now some brilliant footage of you when you actually you know, signed on that day and you got to me. I'm waiting for the chariots of fire music there. <laughs> I think you should get a low camera shot here. Uh, cut there, look at that. That is <laughs> that's wonderful stuff. And obviously, Brian, Barry McGuigan yeah. is a is a long lost uncle of yours because I didn't realise you were such great mates. He's a very passionate man, the chairman. <laughs> very, well, very look passionate. at the two of you. <laughs> Mate, uh, Robbie Farrar, is, is he a chance of going to Newcastle? Or not? Just, I'll just hit you straight. No, nah, I, I think to be honest with you, firstly, um, we've got a lot of a couple of really good younger hookers. Obviously, Denny Levi's a yeah. player who's got a lot of potential and. There's two other, Tyler Randall and, and uh, Young Clydesdale. So there's three hookers in the club already. Uh, most of our decisions will be based on the team improving over a period of time, not short-term decisions. Whilst we will look for one or two experienced players in the short term, mostly sort of long-term decisions. And Robbie's number one goal is firstly to stay at the Tigers or two to stay, stay in Sydney. So yeah. if we w were to be interested, it would rule us out of the equation yeah. anyway, I would have thought. Let me finish interesting stuff with a couple of great Week 2 finals moments from here at Allianz Stadium. And the first is from 1992. Now listen up to this statistic from the Newcastle Knights. In that year, the first two week of the finals, they didn't concede a try. They conceded only five points in total, yet they were knocked out a fortnight short of the grand final. In the lowest scoring finals game since 1924, Newcastle lost to St George 3-2. It was also the first trialless playoff game since the Eels Bulldogs grand final of 1986. A week after thrashing West 21 to 2, the Knights were sent packing when Peter Coyne kicked the field goal with 15 to play. Five years later, but not in a sudden death game, here at the stadium, Newcastle clashed with Manly in week two of the 1997 final series. You could call it the, the third of four chapters that were written between those clubs in that year. Manly had beaten the Knights during the year at Brookvale and Newcastle and would do it again here at the stadium 27 to 12. But Newcastle went into this game without Andrew Johns or Robbie O'Davis, who would both star in the grand final a couple of weeks later. The game was not without controversy. What about the torpedo-style tackle of Nick Kosseff on Matthew Johns? Oh, this is very, very dangerous. That was nasty, and Kosseff was given a one-game suspension as a result. Matty bounced back in the second half to actually be one of the Knights' try scorers. He got a hand on us. Matthew Jones has appealed. Oh, I could go on all night with more finals moments for interesting stuff, but that'll do for now. I'll see you next week. Today's legend of league is the one and only Paul the Chief Harrigan. I never had the privilege of playing against this man. We got to work alongside him and uh, one of nature's gentlemen. You wouldn't miss a, a nicer bloke. Uh, but on the field, as tough as they came, and I guess that's why they referred to our Legend of League this week as the Chief, Paul Harry. Paul Harrigan, welcome to Legend of League. Great to be here. Awesome. Post-career, 14 great years with the footy show on Channel 9. How was that? I had the time of my life. You know, I loved it. I loved the boys. And I've got to say, I did some things I never thought I'd do. Uh, I sang songs I'd never sing in front of anyone. I'm the shyest Blake Gannon around, but I'm, you know, I'm singing songs. I'm doing all sorts of things. Jumping off things, my goodness, I nearly had a heart attack about eight times on that show jumping off different things, but wow, what a, what a ride, it was unreal. From a premiership with Lakes United, it was on to the Newcastle Knights, a foundation member. And in the early days, you know, it, it was so staunch and so proud and we didn't have a lot of great talent. You know, we had to import um, a lot. So we didn't win a lot of games, but man, we were very physical. And our, our people, our town, they loved that, you know, they, that, that reflected our nature as a town. Very tough, very honest. There's a blue one. John, look at Bella. Look at the eyes of Bella. The Chief says, if you want to go, I'll go with you. 92 to 98, you play 
20 consecutive games for New South Wales. When I was a young bloke, I'd watched Queensland dominate so much, I really wanted to be a part of changing this around, and it was deep inside of me. And I did learn something about Origin uh, that I still hold today, is that it, it isn't about skill at all. It comes down to just pure will. Good mates now, but how do you feel about Spud Carroll back in the day? You know, we are, like Spud and I, you know, we're good friends. You know, we, we often ring up on the phone and chat. But mate, back in the day, um, yeah, we hated each other. You know, I mean, it, it was sure as the sun's gonna rise every morning that um, there was a period there of two or three years, every time we come together, it was straight in the blaze. It was just straight on. It was no thought. It was, that was just what it was gonna be. At Newcastle, Paul Harrigan, who signed up with the ARL last night, bust his teammates to Sydney for talks. The ARL are confident of securing the night signatures. In 1995, the Super League war kind of started where we split, you know, origins, you know, two different origins, and it was going a bit crazy. Um, you've got the Super League and the ARL trying to basically sign up most of the Newcastle boys to make sure there's a team here because it was seen as pivotal. Um, very tumultuous and tough time in the town. But 97's when it really kicked in when they split, split the comps. At the same time, the BHP has been the lifeblood of the joint, said, you know, we're moving out of town. It's all over, so there was thousands of jobs lost. But that grimness turned around and, and wow, by, by August, um, September, the team, we're in the semi-finals um, and we're doing great. The whole town, uh, honestly, it lifted everyone up. So by the time we come home, which would be after midnight um, at the Workers' Club, 30, 40,000 people in the middle of the night there celebrating. Um, never seen anything like it in my life. And I've had plenty of older people who have been through when the war finished and all sorts of things saying, you know, this celebration um, is just remarkable. So, you know, you look back at um, individual things you might do, and achieving individual goals is really great. But when you do something like a grand final where everyone um, um, is in it and enjoys it much better. If the Newcastle Knights were a personification of the town being tough and honest, then Paul Harrigan, well, he exemplified the team, uh, certainly in that capacity. Played uh, test football, played Origins obviously, led the side to their grand final victory in 1997 and um, as tough as they come and you guys know him very, very well. Oh mate, remember his def that forward pack, you, you just dreaded Butterfield and Glanville. And he gave it to you, didn't he? Oh, yeah, one of my first NRL games, on. I had the tall, I had headgear, I had, I had shoulder pads, these massive shoulder pads. I didn't want to run into at you. <laughs> oh, they dominated us. He just ragdolled me. And he was, yeah. he was that good. He that said, could have bloke off it too. Yeah. He said at Origin, it's not necessarily about talent or skill, it's about will. And, and I think that's the way that Paul Harrigan played his career. 12 straight seasons with the Knights. Yeah, true. He was such a good player to play with. You talk about will, you know. He, he created that will amongst the team, just the way he was. And you knew he was always going to lead. And he gave you, he gave everyone confidence. You know, he gave everyone that confidence boost needed to be in hostile environments and putting your body on the line. He was a good guy to be alongside. Yeah, great advertisement for our game. And I hope Pam and the kids are doing well up there as well in Newcastle. I think he owns half of Newcastle these days, the Chiefs, so he's going yeah. fine. That now, bus trip, you know that bus trip down? That was his bus. <laughs> On this day, brought to you by Bundaberg Rum. Cheers to a legend. Now, on this day in 1997, old 008 declared himself fit to play in the grand final. After undergoing an operation for a punctured lung and checked if he had a brain and a heart, Joey climbed out of his hospital bed and declared. Yeah, I'm going to play for sure. Um, how the way I feel now, I'm high in spirit, and um, you know, I've got no pain breathing at all, and I think I'll be right. The rest, they say, is history. Newcastle weeping, weeping, tears of jubilation. Fresh from his NRL coaching debut, Knights great Danny Badera stops by and reflects on the highs and lows of life in the top job. Plus, chats about Newcastle's future under Nathan Brown. 
Let's get it on indeed. What a weekend of footy we have enjoyed and we round it out now with the Sunday Footy Show. Thank you very much for your company this morning. Uh, our second last show this time next week we'll be beginning our at-ground coverage of a group, big grand final day. Uh, you'll see everything on Channel 9 as always, all the entertainment, all the games of course and uh, we'll be kicking it off out there at 11 o'clock. A wonderful weekend for Queensland teams of course. We now know that the Brisbane Broncos will take on the North Queensland Cowboys in the first grade grand final, the first ever all Queensland Grand Final. Congratulations to both of those teams. And also the sides beaten this weekend, both Melbourne and the Roosters put together wonderful seasons. Uh, disappointed, obviously, that they fell at the final hurdle. I'm joined by Brad Fittler, Andrew Johns, and another Newcastle legend in Danny Vidir. It's good to see you guys. Hello. How are we? Um, very, very well. Um, did it wet your appetite? You're in charge for a handful of games at the end. Has it wetted the appetite at all? Yeah, it has. It was, it was madness there for a while, but um, I really enjoyed it. Um, the situation I found myself in was probably ideal that I can come in and, and just give them a theme for the week, um, give them a headspace to, to compete. And, and they did that at times. I'm disappointing in the, la the way we finished the last game. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's something that I, I know I want to have probably a career in it, but I've got a lot to learn and I'm uh, looking forward to um, doing that in Nathan. At what stage were you most anxious? Before games, mid-games, after? Um, yeah... Well, probably mid games, you know, because you, when you got to deliver that that speech at, at half time, or um, and I was conscious of the fact I didn't want to go too long, because um, I know I was just trying to think what would I want as a player, yeah. and at times, um, you know, it was, it was brief, but it was just about that accountability and uh, respect they got for each other. So they did really well um, at times, but you know we've got um, a youngish group there um, that need to be coached really, really hard, and, and uh, I'm sure Brownie will do that. All right, we've got Nathan Brown as our legend of league this week, and that's pretty easy, Cage. You just got to come up with 30 themes, one for every week. Yeah. It's really grand final. <laughs> <laughs> Defence one week, that's attack right. one week. <laughs> I don't know about the other 28. Yeah. Yeah. I got to think of some themes. She can. <laughs> <laughs> they mind when you were going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Plenty of fun. <laughs> just want to go back to, to Newcastle quickly, yeah. Danny. Um, Nathan Brown yes. has been appointed there. You are the only current staffer that is assured of the job. You will be there, but he's going to have a look through and everybody else has to reapply. Uh, why is Nathan Brown the right man or the right fit for the Knights? Well, I think he's been waiting for this opportunity for a long time. Um, I really think he's the right man for the job. Um, we're lucky to have him there. He knows so many people within the game. You know, he's a lot of agents. Um, you know, his, his dad's heavily involved up the far north coast, so a lot, of, a lot of kids will come through our club now. Um, that's what we're about. We're a developing club. We've always got to have the kids coming through. And um, not too many things need to change from a, a structure point of view. We've got a, a lot of things right at, there, that's for sure. But we can do things a little bit better. Um, you know, and, and Brownie's teaching individually of these players, these young kids coming through. Um, you know, it's going to be highly important for us. So um, there'll be good times. Everyone at the club is determined to get it back on track. Um, everyone involved at the club. Um, wants to be there that day that we do have some success, um, but it's been a it's been a tough period. We've got our reserve grade playing today in the grand final. Uh, a lot of those guys um, are pretty confident at the moment. Jake Memo coming back, um, maybe it's Clint Newton's last game. So um, if you're around Pertec, get out there for four o'clock. Um, what's the night? The thing with Newcastle, the advantage I think Newcastle had for a long time, they had such a great nursery. Mm. The problem I think is that the fact that. Kids, I don't know if kids aspire to play for their club where they grow up. And, no. you know, one of the things we, we speak about, Joey, is Nathan Brown's biggest problem is getting hold of that North Coast area again. Mm. If you can't do that, what about money-wise? Financially, how's the club sit at the moment? Are you going to be able to compete with the Brisbane's and Roosters and the teams yeah. that seem to be able to, you know, just get it done? I guess we're playing off a different wicket at the moment. Um, what, what we've got... Um Commercially, our sponsors are highly valued. They've been great for us, but the third parties, obviously, that's. But have you got enough of them? That's what I mean. We, we probably don't. Any. We don't. We haven't got any, and it's, it's it's tough, and it's hard to compete, and it's hard to have a, a big pool. Uh, but what we've got to do, that's that's the cards we've got. We've got to develop our players, and um, you know, we've got some structures there that we're, we're pretty confident in. And like I said, Nathan will bring his own ideas in, and we'll individually coach this guy. We've got HPU, which is a high performance unit at the club. That's you know, developing kids like Sione Mentautia, um, and we need to keep emphasising that and drilling some money in there and making sure that that never stops. Oh, we're delighted that you're still so closely involved in the game next year again with the Knights. Nathan Brown will do a fantastic job up there. He's, yeah. he's honest. Uh, he'll be very popular and he'll get the job done. Uh, but we've got a very different um, Allianz R moment this week, and it, um, it does involve our sports bet representative slash owner, 
Joel oh. Kane, <laughs> former great uh, Tiger. You're, you're our only unsale moment. Goal so, kick, Joel. Yeah, well, look, it actually started with the Dragons, Pete. And uh, oh. myself and a mate from Taree, we were invited to an open trial uh, there at uh, Oakey Jubilee. And uh, I left the trial absolutely devastated because I'd had a shocker. My opportunity basically was about to go amiss. Uh, lo and behold, though, the call comes through and I actually make the squad of the Dragons. Now, my mate who came down from Tara, he actually brained the trial but missed out on the team. So anyway, uh, a few months later, I'm down to trial out for the team and uh, uh, the red carpet's been rolled out for me. They absolutely love me down there. We have one trial and I didn't go so well. Two trials, likewise. So we're about to play our first premiership game. And Peter O'Sullivan, the doyen of recruitment, he wants to get my confidence up. Now, this is a bloke who's found Roger Chu of Arsashek, all the Roosters players, the Storm greats, and he knows the premiership's looming, so he rolls out a tape to get my confidence up. And he brings out the trial tape. And we're watching the trial. And he says, Jolie, look at this defence. Do you agree that's a good tackle? I said, absolutely, Pete. He said, this pass, it's just crisp and you're good at a dummy half. Do you agree with that, Pete? I said, absolutely. He said, well, where did it all go wrong? How do we get back doing that? I said, it's going to be very hard, Pete. And he said, why is that? I said, well, that's not me. That's my mate from Taree. And he says, uh, well, who's that bloke? What's his name? <laughs> well, the bloke went on to play 24 <laughs> test matches for Australia, 21 for New South Wales. That man is you, Danny Madeiras. Yeah. I've, been, I've been distraught ever since. I was a big Dragons fan. I love the Dragons. And um, I went down to Newcastle the week later after that trial at uh, St George. I and mean, we played from 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. So... Never looked back from Newcastle, but it was a sore point. I would love to be a Dragons uh, player, but you, I'm a knight. You got graded because they thought you were Because they buggered yeah. it up, exactly right. Yeah. So there you go. I don't know why. We're going to get you back a little bit later on the show. Perfect. It might be Danny. We might do a switch to Rogan. Plenty coming up on the show still. Uh, Laurie Geitz is coming in. She's going to do the celebrity pass-off. Uh, we're going to chat with Steve Renoff live in the studio. We're going to cross up to Queensland and catch up with Justin Hodges as well. But we're going to say goodbye to you, Danny Badira. Thanks for coming down. Thanks for the invite, Stella. Good Appreciate luck, mate, it. with everything, and Thanks, um, good to see you. And um, yeah, we hope the Newcastle Knights have a really good season next year. Cheers, mate. Thanks a lot. Well, I hope Laura can beat your pass off too. Uh, I didn't have ball oh, boys when I went. Still I was the first one to do it, and I'm last. I've been last for years. On this day, brought to you by Bundaberg Rum. Cheers to a legend. On this day in 1997, I reckon probably the greatest day since the beginning of mankind and when bread was invented, played out in front of a capacity crowd at the footy stadium. The Knights won their inaugural premiership. You bloody beauty, Betty Manley on the bell. The fans lined up the highway for miles and the party afterwards. Well, I can't say too much because I can't remember it. Unwisely, some players did national television interviews early the next morning. It was better than a Lego. Knights coach Nathan Brown has revealed he won't be throwing a lifeline to unwanted Tiger Robbie Farah. But Brown does have room to move in the salary cap and is looking for new players. There's obviously numbers of sides out there that are rumoured to have salary cap trouble that are over the cap and we've got a little bit of money available. New recruit Trent Hodkinson sat out the first pre-season training session while he recovers from a broken wrist. Robbie Farrow appears certain to remain at the Tigers after Newcastle coach Nathan Brown ruled out any chance of the New South Wales hooker moving to the Knights. No, Robbie won't be coming to the club. It's uh, as far as I'm aware, you know, Robbie's number one goal is to stay at the Tigers and stay in Sydney. Today was the first day of training for Brown and star recruit Trent Hodkinson at their new club. And the former Bulldog now calling Newcastle home, but is there also a future for Robbie Farrer at the Knights? New Knights coach Nathan Brown won't be offering Robbie Farrer a lifeline despite admitting the club has money to spend on some new additions for 2016. Their big name signing, Trent Hodkinson, joined the club today, but is still coming to terms with leaving the Bulldogs. He's the new shining knight, but Trent Hodkinson is still carrying scars from last season's collision with Tarek Sims, who's now a teammate. He messaged me while I was in hospital, so I just told him that um, thanks for, for making me spend my birthday in hospital. After five years at the Bulldogs, Hodkinson was squeezed out to ease salary cap constraints, a decision that still hurts. Initially I was, I was a little bit devo, you know, I'd been there for a while there and had a lot of good mates. The former Bulldog is the Knights' prize recruit. There'll be a bit of pressure, no doubt, but you know I'm looking forward to the challenge. It will be a very different year for Trent Hodkinson next season, but he's hoping one thing remains the same, keeping his Blues jumper for New South Wales. 
I was lucky to have the success in um, 2014 where we won it, but last year, uh, well this year, earlier this year wasn't wasn't our year, but um, yeah, would love to love to um, you know regain that jersey. Brown and Hodkinson worked together in this year's Origin camp. It was there Brown also developed a good relationship with Robbie Farrar, but he won't be offering the Blues hooker a new home. No, nah, Robbie won't be coming to the club. It's uh, as far as I'm aware, you know, Robbie's number one goal is to stay at the Tigers and stay in Sydney.